And you can go out and uh, on any kind of windy day, you can still you can always fly your frisbee. Um, whereas these gliders were a little bit more delicate and needed just the right conditions. Um, a real challenge was that they you do need to 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 really you know they're best when they're flown indoors and. Um, it's it's hard. It's actually hard to find large indoor spaces. Um, you know, a lot. Usually, a house doesn't. You know, the rooms are too small. You start. You get to the other side too quickly. Um, hallways are too narrow. It's difficult to to stay organized in those. Schools have big spaces, so being in a, in a gymnasium or classroom uh, is great. Great to fly. When people see us flying the walk-along gliders, they, they, you know, a lot of people want to try and do it, and um, a lot of people want to figure out how to make them themselves, or would really like to know where they can get one. And because it's made out of um, unusually lightweight material, it's not the kind of thing that's easy to just go and and you know go to a store and buy the buy the material. And so even though the plane itself is very simple. Um, finding the material and really putting it into the right shape uh, is difficult to, it's just difficult to, you know, just sort of show somebody how to do it. And it looks like a fun toy sort of thing. So, so obviously this idea of, well, can we market this, um, always comes up. And I know back in the 70s, we sold a few for $2 each. And uh, you know, back then, two dollars was a lot of money, so people would, would grumble. But we'd sell them to um, hang glider pilots. You know, we were we were these young young kids, you know, 14, 16, hanging out with all the all the hang glider pilots, and and uh, um, yeah, I got them to buy some of our planes. But then um, we, there there have been numerous attempts to try and get toy companies interested in in the uh, in the glider and it's just it's really difficult to actually get a toy company interested in something that's uh, different um, and something especially something they don't know how to advertise um, they you know it's, it's interesting to see actually how uncreative the toy companies are people at the company um, even went so far as to try to patent the idea and it was at that time that we found out we you know we had come up with this all on our own when we were um, you know when we were kids and um, and we found out that we weren't the first people to think of this idea that there is a, a patent that shows you know almost exactly what we were doing a slightly different design but but a similar idea from 1955 um, Can you tell me any more about that? Do you know any more about the man who did it? Or no, no, don't really know. Don't really know anything about it. Did he um, ever actually sell one? Or he, yeah, yeah. It doesn't seem that it ever uh, yeah. became a toy. Never heard of anybody coming across one. I would also imagine that people have probably come up with it before, because this wasn't based on any new technology. If, if you think it came up before, why did it die out? Why didn't it spread? It just seems such a wonderful. I mean, you're the one who really got it to at least. Yes. I mean, the guy from yes. the 50s never, never happened. I think. I. I mean, it might be that that issue of when somebody shows it, um, it looks really interesting, but it's very difficult for other people to then start doing it. Yeah. Whereas, um, you know, with now. It seems to have really been able to spread because of, because of the internet makes it uh, um, so much uh, makes it makes the idea accessible. It's something also that you need to see it. If someone just describes it, it's like what well, you know whatever. But when you see it, people tend to think, "Wow, I want to do that." <laughs> there was a Scientific American Frontiers show that was um, felt, I guess it was late 90s, and it's a show that, that Alan Alda hosts, and when they were going to do that show, the Scientific American Frontiers show, and spoke with my father, and he convinced them that, that 
you know, our company actually has a lot of interesting things going on. And he also pushed this idea of, well, you want to do a segment on the Walk Along Glider. So they came out and, and we did the filming. So I got to show Alan Alda how to, how to fly the glider. And it's funny, actually, while we were doing that filming, it was, it was outdoors on very calm, early morning, but right in the middle of the flight when they had the cameras on, a little bit of uh, lift came through and the plane was flying you know several feet above and I'm staying underneath it with my hands up as though I've still got control over this I know what I'm doing and um, and that's that's one of these things that I actually learned from my father is that when things are going right you know, pretend like you meant for that to happen um, but it, so it, so it ended up making a nice segment but also that TV show has a website associated with it. They asked if people were gonna, could they write in questions, and you know, would I be able to answer some questions on the on the website? And I said I would, but I also knew what the the main question was gonna be, which is where can I get one? And they aren't available anywhere. I but I also thought, well, you know, this might be just the opportunity. I could I could build these myself. And um, because now I've got a free marketing opportunity, um, and this is this is another actually a key thing that I've learned from watching my father um, develop things is that is that as you you know as you make some progress or succeed in something, other opportunities will show up and. You, um, you know, and you go a long way if you keep taking advantage of that next opportunity that shows up, and you wind up following a, a development path that um, that you couldn't have planned out, couldn't have predicted, and um, and it's not you know it's not even something necessarily that you wanted to do to begin with. Um, but it's just that when when a success happens, it you know new opportunities are, are going to present themselves, and at that point you have this choice to say, well, I did this, let me just you know stop at this at this success, I achieved what I wanted to do, or um, say, well you know let's take this unique opportunity and see where it uh, see where it takes me. So I had this opportunity for some great free advertising. Um, the the internet was around now, so I was um, so I could I could actually do all this myself. So I figured the first step was to I needed to make a website, and I didn't know how to make a website, but I um, I got some website making software, and um, you know just looking at other websites, I started to put something together. And then I must have asked somebody or searched around on the internet to find out, well, how can I figure out, how can I take people's credit card, you know, how can I get money from, the, from this website? And I, um, I got that linked in. And, um, and then I, uh, and then I was, it's like, okay, but now I also need to figure out how to make these gliders. Um, or you know, a first, a, a, actually, a very first thing I did was before I decided I was going to go into business, I did enough prototyping to convince myself that I could make these gliders myself. So that was, uh, you know, so this was going to be my my business model. I'm going to be building these. I'm going to do everything myself, um, and that way I don't have to coordinate with anybody else. Um, and I'm going to sell them on the internet. And I figured out, you know, what am I going to charge for these? And I knew I was going to get tired of making them really quick, um, unless I was making a, uh, a a big profit on them. Um, so, um, so I actually I sold them. They they cost me five dollars to to make and to ship. Um, and, but I, I sold them for $15, so every time I make one, I'm making $10, and I was like, okay, that's enough money to keep me motivated. Um, and, and 
Um, oh, and the shipping was another, you know, it's like, how am I going to ship these? What sort of box am I going to put these in? And I, um, so I found some cheap boxes. Um, and I and I sort of knew how I was going to make how I was going to make the planes, and then um, but I also said on my website, you know, like I had always heard when I was a kid, you you have to wait six to eight weeks for delivery. So this I figured, okay, I'm going to have I've got I've got a nice window here, um, and then I remember sitting at home and waiting for um, uh, just waiting for the show to air. And I had my website up and running, and the show aired. And by the end of the show, I think I had orders for 200. And by the next day, I had orders for 600. And I hadn't figured out how to make them. I mean, I, or I knew how to make them, but I hadn't actually made one yet in, a, in, a, in my real production setup. Um, so, and, and so that's when the panic started. Um, and I, so then I furiously figured out what do I, how, you know, I, I was going to um, buy sliced, pre-sliced pre foam, cut out these wing shapes. Um, I made 10 little aluminum molds that I could just make myself. I just bent sheets of aluminum, squished the wings in there. Um, I went to Sears to, to get a convection oven that would blow air around. Found out um, that actually the their convection oven wouldn't cook at low enough temperature, um, so I went back and returned the convection oven, and actually, and I ended up having to buy um, a, a two thousand dollar, very expensive oven that would hold its temperature within one degree throughout it, and um, and then I could get these wings because the foam had to be cooked hot enough to mold it, but not hot enough to melt it. And there's a, just a few degree difference there with the with the styrofoam. Why didn't you um, expand it? Expand the polystyrene? Well, I didn't have a mold to like expand okay. into. Um, you know, I didn't have a real production thing. All I all I had was, uh, you know, I knew I could I could bend aluminum. Right. And also, um, to make like I wouldn't want to make a finished mold because it might not be the right shape and then I'd have to make a whole new mold. So I made something that I was I was going to be able to keep modifying, keep changing. And um, but anyway, I figured out how to produce these and um, set up, you know, sort of a, a mass production system at home where I was I was putting um, you know, labels had to figure out how to make labels for them. Had to figure out how to get nose weights, which were the special washer that I got from a, um, a certain chain of hardware store um, in Los Angeles. And they were the only ones selling these, just these right washers. And so I had to go around to all their different um, outlets in, and, and buy all the washers they had of this one, this one type. Um, and so I'm, you know, frantic, you know, figuring out how to make labels, figuring out what the postage needs to be. Um, I was making these things and putting them in boxes and sending them, and um, and but um, well, and then and then people started writing back saying, well, you know, the box arrived, but it was it was destroyed, um, and. And they, mo most of them, most of them made it okay. The ones that didn't make it successfully, I just um, immediately I would refund the money and um, and send them a new one. And you know the idea is, is and and that's when I started realizing that um, customer service is a big time-consuming part of of a business, um, as is. Um, Packaging and shipping; um, those were, you know, those those ended up taking um, as much time as my manufacturing, um, and and I also, you know, and and wanted to make sure I was selling a good product, so I I test fly each one, and I also had to write up directions to include in the box and go to Kinkos and get those all made. So I was just sort of, um, I had I had used a technique. Another technique that I, I think I had learned from my dad that you don't have to know what you're doing to go ahead and do something. Um, 
the you know the best way to learn is is by doing it. And so here, you know, I was going to be sort of you know running my own business, and I didn't know anything about running my own business. So I went and I just um, did it. And and it, I mean when when. Um, <laughs> scary part was was I think a day or two after I had gotten these initial orders I had the credit card thing set up so that I was actually taking the money from people um, right when they placed the order <clears throat> and the credit card company called me up they said hey we see you're a new business you look like you're doing a great business we just want to make sure that you're shipping within 24 hours um, and because it turns out the law is you have to ship within 24 hours of actually taking somebody's money. Um, and if you can't ship that quickly, you can get you get an authorization to take the money, but you don't actually charge the person's you know actually charge their credit card until you deliver. Um, and and I told her uh, no, I'm I I'm no I. I'm not shipping in 24 hours. I'm a, a little but behind you, on but that. But you told them that, that, and, that that was... Well, yeah, that's what I figured. Yeah, I, said, yeah. I said six to eight weeks, but it turns out it's the law that you can't take the money and then say six to eight weeks later, um, or at least maybe just when it's credit card, perhaps you're not allowed to do that. Um, and she was, but she was very nice. She said, um, well, just get them out as soon as you can <laughs> and so uh, you know so I wound up I actually started learning a lot about um, credit card companies and why Visa and MasterCard are the two main ones um, and um, and and um, how to deal with um, the slightly irate person who actually checks their credit card statement and says hey I've been charged for this and it hasn't been delivered I'm like oops Okay, that person goes up to the top of my list of who to get a plane to quickly, um, and so I had all these, you know, all these difficulties, um, and then the the issue with the boxes, and so I thought, you know, what I really need are some custom made boxes. So I went to custommadeboxes.com and ordered boxes, which are now more expensive, but they were going to be exactly the right size for my gliders, and um, and they were smaller. And, and they were, they were really nice, but um, um, I and, and so I kept that business going for for a few months. Ended up selling two thousand planes, so so making twenty twenty thousand dollars profit, um, um, and I still have a nice two thousand dollar oven left over. Um, so I um, kept making them stay in business for, for several months. The orders, since I wasn't doing any more advertising, there were some reruns of the show, but um, eventually the, the orders started dwindling to where there'd be um, a dozen in a week or then even less. Um, and then, then I found I could keep up. I could, <laughs> I could do that. But by then, I was also really tired of taking boxes together and um, filling up my car with boxes and going to the post office. The post office didn't, didn't like me. They said I was filling up all their bins.